Hey y'all, hope everybody's doing good. Today we're going to talk about the Mongolian Empire and its effect on the East Asian region. Uh, the Mongolian Empire existed during the 13th and 14th century and it was the largest continuous land empire, which means it's the largest empire in history that all of the conquered lands touched one another. Uh, the only empire that was larger didn't have lands that touched one another. They conquered different lands from all over the world, and that was the British Empire. Now, if we were to compare the two uh, on this map, you can see the Mongolian Empire compared to the uh, British Empire. As you can see, the Mongolian Empire in red, all the lands are connected. And the British Empire in blue, all the lands are separated. The Mongolian Empire stretched from Eastern Europe and parts of Central Europe to the Sea of Japan, extending northward into parts of Siberia, east and south into the Indian subcontinent. And if you remember what made the Indian subcontinent a subcontinent, it's the plate tectonics that happened whenever the Himalayan mountains were created. Uh, then it also stretched into mainland Southeast Asia, which is the next region we're gonna learn about, and the Iranian plateau. And then it also stretched to the west as far as the Levant and Carpathian mountains. So the Mongol empire emerged from the unification of several nomadic tribes in the Mongol homeland under the leadership of Genghis Khan. He lived from, six, from 1162 to 1227, and a council proclaimed him ruler of all the Mongols in 1206. Under his rule, the empire grew rapidly, and that of his descendants, it also grew. Um, they sent invading armies in all different directions at one time, which is what helped the empire grow so fast. The uh, transcontinental empire uh, connected the east and the west, uh, so the lands in the east and the lands in the west, and the Pacific and Mediterranean uh oceans and seas in an enforced Pax Mongolica it allowed the dissemination and exchange of trade technologies commodities and ideologies uh, across the whole Eurasian um, continent now you might be sitting there thinking what is Pax Mongolica okay Pax is a Roman term. Putting Pax in front of essentially Mongol, uh, it's comparing the Mongolian Empire to the Roman Empire. Because even though the Roman Empire was a huge empire, the Mongolian Empire was even bigger. Uh, essentially, Pax Mongolica, uh, it's also less often known as Pax Tatarica. It's a historiographical term modeled after the original phrase Pax Romana, which describes the stabilizing effect of the conquest of the Mongol Empire on the social, cultural, and economic life of the inhabitants of the vast Eurasian territory. Comparing the Mongol Empire to the Roman Empire, they basically ran things a lot, a lot alike, but um, the uh, the Mongol Empire typically put more power in the hands of the ruler than the Roman Empire. So let's talk about the Roman emperors. The first was Genghis Khan. He ruled from twelve o six to twelve. 27 uh, 
under his rule, you're going to have the most gain of land uh, as far as square footage. The next ruler from 1229 to 1241 was Ogadai Khan. Um, Ogadai Khan was the official heir of uh, Genghis Khan. Now, just because he was the official heir does not mean that he just simply said, okay, you know, dad's dead, we're going to take over. Uh, there was there was a lot of conflict because when Genghis Khan took over a land, he not only um, took over the land, but he also created a harem, which is basically a whole lot of wives. So he had a whole lot of heirs. He had a whole lot of children and a whole lot of sons. <laughs> uh, so whenever Genghis Khan died, nobody really knew exactly who was going to take over. So there was a lot of civil war, a lot of fighting. And this guy, Ogadai, uh, took over, finally beating everybody out eventually. And then after Ogadai, uh, from 1246 to 1248 was Guake Khan, uh, kind of the same situation. I mean, obviously, you can tell he only ruled for two years. Uh, he died in a civil war. And basically, there was another um, conflict between who was actually going to be the ruler of Mongolia. And he was killed by Monke Khan. So Monke Khan... Uh, Ruled from 1251 to 1259. Another short rule, right? Again, it's like a episode of Jerry Springer and the Khan family. They um, they can't decide who wants to control the country. So there's a lot of civil wars and a lot of issues. Uh, under, or I'm sorry, after Monke Khan uh, from 1260 to 1294 Kublai Khan um, spread the Mongolian Empire into China and uh, into basically he, he was the one that controlled most of the southern lands and then finally the last emperor of the Mongolian Empire was uh, from 1333 to 1368 that was Togan Timur Khan um, after Togon Timur Khan, the Chinese finally did uh, overpower uh, the Mongol Empire and um, and took back their lands, pretty much. So by the time of Kublai's death in 1294, the Mongol Empire had fractured into four separate uh, empires each pursuing its own separate interests and objectives. The Golden Horde in the Northwest, the Chagate in the Central Asian area, uh, the Ilkhante in the Southwest, and the Yun Dynasty in the East based in modern-day Beijing, which is the capital of China. Um, in 1304, the three Western empires briefly accepted a normal uh, rule of the Yun dynasty. But in 1368, the Han Chinese Ming dynasty took over the Mongol capital. The Genghis rulers of the Yan retreated to the Mongolian homeland and continued to rule there as the Northern Yin Dynasty. Uh, the Ilkhante uh, fell apart in the period of 1335 to 1353, and the Golden Horde had broken into competing empires by the end of the 15th century and were defeated and thrown out of Russia. 
1480. All right, also now let's talk about the Great Wall of China and how it affected the Mongol Empire. Uh, so, a little brief history on the Great Wall of China. It's not all just one wall. Uh, it's the collective name of a series of fortification systems generally built across the historic northern borders of China to protect it and consolidate territories of Chinese states and empires against various nomadic groups. The Mongols were the main nomadic group that the Chinese were trying to protect against. Uh, so over centuries, several walls were being built from as early as um, 7th century uh, to uh, later be joined together by Qin Shi Huang, uh, the first emperor of China. Uh, little, there's, there's very little of Qin's wall that remains. Um, later on, many successive dynasties have built and maintained multiple stretches of the border wall. Uh, the most well-known sections of the wall were built in the Ming Dynasty from 1368 to 1644. Uh, so, apart from defending China from nomadic tribes such as the Mongols, uh, the other purpose of the Great Wall have included border controls, allowing the imposition of duties on goods. Uh, so a duty on a good is like a tax. Um, so basically if they wanted to transport um, anything into China or out of China on the Silk Road, they had to pay a tax to cross the wall. Uh, they regulated or encouragement of trade um, because it was a protection. It, it showed merchants that they could walk across this area and be safe. Um, it also controlled immigration. The Chinese uh, didn't want um, any mingling of races or anything, so uh, they built this wall to keep people out and keep their people in. Um, furthermore, the, de the defensive characteristics of the Great Wall were enhanced by the construction of watchtowers, troop barracks, garrison stations, signaling cap capabilities uh, through the means of smoke and fire, and the fact that the path of the Great Wall also served as a transportation corridor. So whenever you are bringing material to trade into China or out of China, you could actually take the Great Wall and move your product along that for protection. Um, so the wall uh, was built by different dynasty over multiple, multiple centuries. Um, collectively, they stretch from Liaodong in the east of uh, to the top uh, of uh, Lop Lake in the west. Um, then to present day Xin Rushin border, so the northern border of China and uh, Russia. Uh, in the north to the Tahoe River in the south. And along an arc that roughly delineates the edge of the Mongolian steep. Um, a comprehensive archaeological survey using advanced technologies. So uh, I don't know if you've heard of LIDAR. Um, that's where they send drones in the air and uh, shoot laser beams down. Uh, and the laser beams come back to the drone with uh, heights and different data points. Uh, and they can make maps out of that. Um, 
they've constructed, they've concluded that the wall, uh, or the walls, because it's not just one big wall, it's multiple walls, uh, built by the Ming Dynasty, measured about 8,850 kilometers or 5,500 miles. This is made up of uh, 6,259 kilometers or 3,889 mile sections of actual wall, and then 359 kilometers or 223 miles of trenches, and 2,232 kilometers or 1,387 miles of natural defensive barriers such as hills and rivers. So the Great Wall isn't just one big wall, like I've said before. Uh, they used natural barriers, so rivers, so one part of the wall might end at the mouth of a river and might begin at the beginning of the river. Um, they used different hills, so maybe a really steep hill that nobody can climb. They used that hill. Uh, so it's not just one massive connecting wall. There's multiple different sections. Um, And the basic uh, reasoning behind the wall was uh, for protection and uh, protection against invading armies, uh, protection against uh, mingling of races, and uh, protection for merchants that are wanting to trade uh, on the Silk Road. So in conclusion, the Mongol Empire, the Mongols were um, a nomadic tribe that conquered most, if not, I would say about 99% of the actual continent of Asia and into parts of Europe and Africa. Uh, these people were uh, warring tribes. They, the Mongols were multiple tribes that would fight against each other, so they were warring tribes. Um, and they were all great cavalrymen. So if you needed somebody that could stay on their horse, at a full gallop and, uh, and be able to shoot a bow and arrow accurately, accurately, these were the guys that you would go to. Um, so in their attempts to, uh, conquer uh, the lands of Asia, their, their culture traits diffused, so cultural diffusion uh, diffused and were adopted by other cultures that were obviously conquered by them. Um, and you can see parts of that in current life as well. The uh, Great Wall of China was built to fortify China to keep the Mongols and other nomadic tribes out, but also it was to uh, keep their the Chinese people in and keep them protected from uh, mingling with other races and um, keep them safe from the nomadic tribes. Also, it was meant to protect traders, uh, not like people that stab you in the back, but people that take their um, take their goods and go to different parts of the world and sell them. Uh, this was used by the, or these people used the Silk Road and the Great Wall of China protected parts of the Silk Road. And also the Great Wall, you could actually use it as a road, not just a wall. So because of the Mongol Empire, the biggest reason the Great Wall of China was built was to protect the Chinese people from the Mongol Empire. Hope you guys enjoyed the video and uh, hope to see you soon.